to this convention a very prominent and effective congressman from the 20th District of Illinois. He has served his people there in that district since 1961. He has 20 years of seniority and is the senior member of both the Agriculture Committee and also Foreign Affairs Committee. He is recognized because of his very firm stand in fighting inflation and insisting that the government spend within its income. He's a very strong advocate of foreign defense and bolstering domestic and national defense. He's an effective spokesman for his party and his point of view, and he has worked very closely with our Washington office, and we're anxious and willing to work with him and his staff. And many of our people in the state of Illinois worked for his reelection this past November. And I'm looking forward to his very candid remarks in regards to agriculture, and I'm sure that his advice will be taken more seriously during this administration than perhaps it was during the last four years. And so I introduce to you Congressman Paul Finley from the 20th District of Illinois. Congressman. Thank you, President Woodland, for that uh, generous introduction. And thanks to all of you for the warm welcome. It's an honor to be invited to speak to the National Convention of the National Farmers Organization. And Mr. President, I say that with special feeling because this is the second time I've had this privilege. Last time was when the convention gathered in Keel Auditorium in St. Louis. I'm not sure how many years ago that was. Can any of you remember the convention in Keel Auditorium? Well, good. And it's a special pleasure because the invitation came through a man that I respect and admire very much your Washington representative, Charles Fraser. You work in the, the precinct, so to speak, taking care of crop production and marketing responsibilities. And it may well be that you, like myself, tend to take for granted what the people in the central office do. I know I tend to take for granted what is done on my behalf by my staff. And I welcome this chance to state to you that Chuck Fraser does a splendid job for you, and he's assembled a very efficient, highly professional, very reliable, well-respected team that works full-time on your behalf in the nation's capital. And it brings back fond memories to have a chance to see Mrs. Dale Nass. I haven't seen Dale yet, but I know that Dale is still here in be behalf of NFO Endeavors as he has been, I think, since the very origin of this organization. So it's uh, a pleasure to have this chance. I feel that I'm among friends here today I say that after reading through the folder that the organization has printed up, the one that, uh, that carries the title, The Washington Office, lists some of the legislation that NFO supported on Capitol Hill during the past year. And I went over that, and I found to my delight that my batting average is pretty good. I stood with NFO on eight occasions out of the ten listed, and uh, I think that's a fairly good report card. In fact, that's better than average in our household. 
My wife reads very carefully the congressional record, and when I come home at night, she asks me to defend my position. And I find that if I bat 50-50 on the positions that I've taken, as contrasted with the positions that she would have taken had she been on the House floor voting, I'm doing pretty well. So I think my batting average with NFO at 80% is really something to be proud of, and I'm glad to mention that. I have watched the development of NFO since its very beginning, back in the 1950s, at which time I was a country editor managing and edit editing the weekly newspaper in Pittsfield, Illinois. And I'm sure all of you know that Pittsfield is known worldwide as the pork capital of the universe. Now, I, don't, I mean no affront to any of you who produce pork outside Pike County, but we prize ourselves on being the county that ships more poundage of pork every year than any other county in the country. Now, I imagine every state has a similar county or two, but we take great pride in that fact. And from the beginning of that experience with NFO, I have noted with satisfaction that the cardinal, the principal, the strongest element in the NFO's program is keeping control of American agriculture in the hands of farmers. And to that I say amen. And I hope you never deviate from that as your fundamental goal. I'm not sure just how many farming units there are in my home county of Pike County, but there are, there are quite a few probably about seven or eight hundred. And stretch across this great land of ours, there are at least three million farming units. And this means three million pretty independent people in charge of the production unit. Because if there is any quality that sets farmers off, from the rest of the population of this country, it is that spirit of independence, and I hope that spirit will survive forevermore too. But it creates problems, as well as opportunities and advantages. And I'm glad that the NFO has placed such great emphasis on strengthening the bargaining power of farmers in the private market. I would list that in my own evaluation of your organization as the number two objective of NFO. Keeping the farmers in control of farming and strengthening the bargaining power of farmers as individuals. Because this independent spirit tends to make farmers want to manage their own destiny to decide just when and how they're going to market their commodities. And to the extent that that prevails, it puts them at a very decided disadvantage with the buyers. It's been said so often, and I'm sure you've heard it said often, that farmers buy at retail and sell at wholesale. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, that uh, simplified characterization of American agriculture. So I think the goal of NFO in attempting to strengthen the bargaining power of farmers is a laudable objective, and I am sure that you will stick to that. Then the third objective that I noted from the very first experience I had with NFO back in the 1950s was that the farmers who are banded together in this organization want to get their income from the marketplace and not from government checks. And I congratulate you on that objective, too. The other day I had uh, a very welcome visit in my office in Washington, Bill Hungate of Missouri. And I hope that some of you have had the 
great fun and pleasure of knowing Bill Hungate. He was a congressman from eastern Missouri, stretching from St. Louis up to about Quincy on the Illinois side for a number of years. Then he became a U.S. federal judge. I, I hear some applause from Missouri. A great man, isn't he? Well, in any event, he was in my office and he, he tried to make a, a point to me with a story. He told about the, the man that went into a country store and he noticed a, a gentleman sitting in a chair in the country store and by him was this great big enormous dog. Well, the visitor uh, liked dogs and he uh, said to the gentleman, uh, is, your, is your dog a friendly dog? Does he bite? Would it be all right to pet your dog? And the fellow said, my dog is a very friendly dog. It's quite all right to pet him. You won't get in any trouble at all. Well, the visitor reached over and started to pet the dog. The dog jumped on him and just about tore his arm off. Well, by the time he had recovered his composure, he was just astonished to, to realize that this man had said that his dog was friendly and it would be okay to pet him. So he said, now why in the world would you have told me that uh, I could pet, pet, your, pet your dog safely when I petted this dog and he about took my arm off? Well, Bill Hungate's story said that uh, the man responded, that isn't my dog. <laughs> well, it's important to keep your facts straight. Whether you're petting dogs or dealing with Congress or dealing with farmers. So I'm going to try to keep my facts straight here this morning. First of all, I want you to know this plain fact. I'm not here as an emissary of President-elect Ronald Reagan, although I would welcome that opportunity. I'm not here to uh, give you some hitherto unpublished information about who is going to be the new Secretary of Agriculture, although I want to tell you that I like Bob Dole's recommendation that that President-elect Reagan select a hands-on farmer to head the USDA. I like that idea. And you'll forgive me from expressing a little bit of home state pride in, in voicing my approval <clears throat> of the person of John Block, who is now the Director of Agriculture for Mr. Lincoln's home state, and whose name is one of those mentioned quite prominently, John Block is a hands-on farmer. He knows exactly how to shovel corn. He knows how to raise hogs. He knows the problems that farmers face from one end of the year to the other. And in my view, he has the capacity to do a splendid job as Secretary of Agriculture should the challenge and opportunity come his way. But. Even though I'm not here with any mandate from President-elect Reagan, I'm going to sound just a little note that I hope he will hear all the way to California or wherever he happens to be this morning. And that recommendation is that he take on as one of his principal objectives as President of the United States the mantle of Teddy Roosevelt we need a president who will go after monopoly, who will go after bigness, who will try to bring as much competition into our economic life as he possibly can. We need a trust buster as we've never needed one before. I'm tired of these these joint ventures that bring big oil companies together, that consolidate already too big corporate giants into ever greater bigness. It ill serves the, the interest of the American people, including farmers, to have this go forward. And I hope that our new president will make strong endeavors in behalf of antitrust action to break up monopoly, to give consumers a fair break at the marketplace. Now the fact number two that I want to mention is one that won't surprise any of you at all, and that fact is that farmers are human beings. They are people. They aren't bales or bushels or gallons. They are people, and they ought to be dealt with as people. Farmers are just as concerned about inflation as anybody living in the city, in fact, more so, because it seems, in fact, it is a fact that farm prices don't go up 
whereas the cost of doing business keeps soaring and never comes down. So farmers, more than anyone else in our society, are painfully aware of the problems of inflation and, in my experience, stand even more resolutely behind prudent management of our federal budget as a necessary step towards mastering this dread disease called inflation. Farmers are just as concerned about foreign policy as are anyone else in the country. Farmers are interested in prices on corn and wheat and hogs and other commodities, but they are even more interested in seeing to it that our country is militarily strong and that we protect this great cause of peace with every initiative we possibly can. There's no doubt about that. Farmers, the fact number three that I'd like to mention to you, and this too is no surprise to any of you, is that farmers are efficient. Now, they aren't all alike. In fact, you can look up and down the row that you're sitting in and probably find neighbors who are less efficient managers than you are, and perhaps one or two who are more efficient managers. But by and large, the farmers of this country are the most efficient producers of food and fiber the world has ever known. And farmers stand out in our economy today as the one sector of the economy that is way ahead of the rest of the world, and I think almost absolutely certain to stay ahead in terms of efficiency. And this is a source of pride that I think we can boast about as we deal with our city brethren. Fact number four that I would list for your consideration is that inflation is the greatest peril that our nation faces. I thought it was interesting that uh, candidate Reagan, in speaking in his farm speech September the 30th in Iowa, said the first step that has to be taken is to have the federal government stop robbing American farmers through inflation. That's a direct quote. Let me read a few more of the words that uh, President-elect Reagan said on that occasion when he was a candidate for the presidency. He said, my first goal will be to lead this nation out of the economic disaster brought about by the Carter administration. This can be done. We must make a bold commitment to genuine economic growth. We must restrain the growth in federal spending. We must bring the growth and the supply of money back into line with our economy's ability to increase its output of goods and services. We must reduce the tax rate burdens now imposed on the American people so that the people will be able to invest in their own future. Curbing inflation is a vital first step, vital to farmers and to all other Americans. That's the end of the quotation. Well, I've so viewed inflation myself in recent years. Now, the Soviet Union is a great peril to our nation. Most of the weapons that the Soviets own are pointed our way, so they do obviously represent an enormous threat to our safety and security, the survival of freedom in our society. And yet, I think any reasonable person would have to judge inflation an even worse peril to our nation than the Soviet Union, great though that peril is, from Moscow. Because inflation is gradually eating away at the financial independence of the great middle class of our country. The working class, the working people, like the farmers of our nation, we are gradually becoming dependent upon government checks for our survival month by month. About 30 percent of our population now receives regularly U.S. Treasury checks, substantial sums, and this has become, this has become a narcotic. We are hooked on government checks. And to the extent that the American people depend upon government for the money to see them through day by day and month by month, they lose their freedom as individuals. 
They become wards of the state. And that's why I say that the first order of business of any wise administration must be to curb inflation, to eliminate this great peril to the survival of liberty in our society. And I have been trying to get through a constitutional amendment, believing that only a constitutional amendment will bring about the needed discipline to require that government at long last live within its means as a nation and stop this foolishness of piling up debt to pass on to future generations who surely have no responsibility for these misdeeds on our part. The committee on which I serve, the Committee on Agriculture, also has a responsibility beyond farm programs, and that is responsibility for the food stamp program. And I recognize that the food stamp program does a lot of good for a lot of people. And it certainly is a means through which food comes from the farms of America to people who need it. But I also believe that this welfare program, like every other welfare program we, we have, needs to be reformed, needs to be brought in line with the traditional work ethic of our nation. And with that in mind, four years ago, I was the author of an amendment to the food stamp law called Workfare. And it may be that no one of you has ever heard of the Workfare idea. Well, let me tell you briefly what it is. Under the Workfare provision of food stamps, there are authorized 14 pilot projects that are now functioning throughout the country. And in those pilot projects, able-bodied people who, under the food stamp law, are supposed to be hunting for a job as a condition of eligibility for stamps, are required to show up at the local county government office or the local city government office and work off at the minimum wage rate the value of the food stamps they get. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? It is, it is working. Out in San Diego County, the largest city of the nation that is now in the, work, the Workfare Project, San Diego County is in the second year of Workfare. They took a survey of the community on Election Day, November the 4th, and they found that over 98, 95% of the people that voted on November the 4th approved of Workfare now in its second year in San Diego County. I have talked with people that were working under the workfare provision in San Diego County, and every one of them, the day I talked with them, was pleased to have a job to do. They thought it was a good idea that they were being required to work off the value of the stamps they were getting. They felt it was going to help them to a better life. And I talked to two women working in the county clerk's office that day in San Diego County, and each of them said that they had been under workfare under food stamps a little while before, they had done such a good job as part-time workfare employees that when a full-time opening occurred, the county clerk hired them for a full-time job. It shows how workfare can help people to break loose from this terrible syndrome of welfare and get into the public employment and private employment sector. And this, I hope, will be one of the goals of the new administration to broaden this idea of workfare to encourage people to work, to get out of this terrible hang-up of generation after generation being on welfare. That is not in the American tradition for people to be stymied in government handouts. What they really want, all of them, I'm sure, is the opportunity for work. And I think the food stamp program called Workfare should be broadened to the entire nation so that wherever people are able-bodied in getting food stamps, they shall be required to work off the value of the stamps that they get. Otherwise, no stamps. Well, I think I've probably talked too long. Could I have about five more minutes? Ten. Ten, okay. <laughs> I want to say just a word about agriculture and what's ahead. I hope that the next Congress will go easy on major changes in the commodity programs, the major farm bill programs. 
I think they have worked out, by and large, reasonably well. And I hope and expect that we will not make radical changes. And I say that with full support for the objective of the NFO to keep farmers from becoming dependent upon government checks. I hope also that the next administration will work hard to expand markets for farm products. That is one, one of my consuming activities uh, over many years. I headed a trade expansion mission to the Soviet Union. I was glad when the Soviet Union became a multi-billion dollar customer of the American farmer. And the sooner we get back on that same relationship with the Soviet uh, government, the better off we will be and the better off will be the cause of peace. Thinking back to the Pearl Harbor days, can anyone really seriously believe that Japan would ever have attacked Pearl Harbor had the Japanese people been as, as dependent then as they are now on food shipped from the United States? Ships of food to Japan former, form an endless chain across the Pacific Ocean from the United States to the shores of Japan. Every 200 miles, you will find a shipload of food from America's farmland going to Japan. Can anyone seriously believe that the government of Japan would strike a blow, a military blow, at a nation which was so important to their survival? I can't believe it for a minute. And the sooner we reestablish a strong grain trade with the Soviet Union, the sooner we will have a, an improved prospect for peaceful relations with that nation. The Soviets have finally gotten a taste of a better diet. Their people have found out what it is like to have a little meat on the table once a day. And so are the Chinese. And we ought to cultivate these appetites and make them dependent upon America's food supply in the name of peace. And I hope that that will be one of the endeavors that the Reagan administration will, will put forward. Now I want to voice a note of caution, and I hope I don't get in too much trouble here. I know there are a lot of dairy farmers present. And you may have some uh, slight criticism of what I've done in the past because I was that mean old guy who last year tried to get an amendment in the Dairy Price Support Program to give Secretary Berglund a little flexibility in keeping the 80% parity support. Well, I didn't prevail. The amendment didn't get in, and we are now finding an enormous buildup of government stocks of dairy products. I ask you to think carefully about what's ahead for the dairy farmer if we fail to give some flexibility to the Secretary of Agriculture in the management of parity price supports. It could well lead to trouble that you never dreamed of, and I ask you to give it your careful thought. I also would ask this organization to give every effort it can to convincing the Congress and the administration that embargoes on food exports are bad for the American people, not just for farmers, but for the American people. I think it was a serious mistake on the part of the Carter administration last January to impose the partial embargo on grain shipments to the Soviet Union. Now we are coming up against the, the date in January at which time President Carter, who will still be in office, will have to decide whether to reinstate the embargo or let it die. I think that date is January the 5th. It's, it'll be around that date in any event. And I hope this organization, through its individuals and perhaps through its uh, uh, national officers, can find it possible to convey to the Carter administration the need to terminate the grain embargo and get it done at the, soon, the earliest possible date. I hope you would concur with me in that recommendation because I think it is bad for all of the people of this nation to have food exports turned on and off like a spigot to serve the interests of our foreign policy objectives. One of our major requirements is to establish our credibility as a reliable supplier of food. If we if we damage that credibility, we are asking for trouble in the long run. 
We had three embargoes of uh, food exports in recent years, two of them dealing mainly with Japan. And to this day, the Japanese government and the, J the leaders of Japan tremble when they look back on those days when there was a big question mark over our reliability as a shipper of soybean products to Japan. And they began immediately to look around and try to develop other alternate sources of food in Brazil and Malaysia and elsewhere. And if we go the route of using food export policy as a tool of international politics, we are causing enormous problems for every citizen of this country and especially for the farmers. Well, I think I've uh, talked long enough. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to share a few ideas with you. And I hope, as Bill Hungate uh, enjoined me to do, that I kept the facts straight. Thank you very much.